Um, good afternoon, everyone, for those who are in Australia. Um, my name is Sarah. I am uh, one of the UCO organizers of the Australian Circular Economy Conference. Uh, we're really glad to have this event today. And before we start, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am currently standing, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respect to elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, and this is very important because we're talking about building a new world and um, we must start by acknowledging that Australia always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, now I would like to pass the mic to uh, Anya who has been organizing this event and she will introduce the session for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. Um, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is Anna Paradoska, and I'm an industry engagement manager at ANSTO and um, professor at Advanced Structure and Materials in the University of Sydney. I have lots of hats, and one of them is a, a deputy chair of uh, up, um, National Committee of Applied Mechanics in Engineers Australia. And we organized this event uh, with University of Sydney and National Committee of Applied Mechanics to introduce applied mechanics to waste. And we are so excited to have uh, Cri Professor Christopher Garvey um, uh, from Sweden uh, with us today, who will be talking about the microplastics, the fate of microplastics. So Chris works with me in the past at ANSTO and it moved now to Europe uh, for having some interesting career choices and uh, I'm sure it's going to be a very attractive visual presentation and uh, Chris the floor is yours um, the space is yours. thank you and get it the right way around this time well oh, and that's the first slide I need to put it up to the front oh. And back again. And I need to do this again. Okay, thank you, Anya. Um, what, what I'm going to talk about today is some work uh, that we've done looking at uh, the what happens to plastics in the environment. And um, this this work was sponsored by the CNRS and uh, the University of Paris Sacre. Um, it was part of a sabbatical I had in Paris a few years ago. Um, but um, I, I, I'd like to sort of give this a different uh, a slant uh, than I usually do, which is a, a focus on the, 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 what's actually happening. But th this, this work has a wider um, environmental uh, impact in the, so far as that um, th there's a lot of, work, there's a lot of uh, stories in the media about what happens to plastics, and I, I'm going to talk about that at some length. But um, the, 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 the take-home message is that actually what we expect to happen to mad-made materials in the environment is actually quite, can be quite different than we first thought. And, and a third title, if you like, of, of this work is um, when, when it comes to thinking about things in the environment, and I mean, this has obvious relevance for the circular economy, uh, we have the aspirational thinking and in some sense, that's a bit of a polemic. And, and this work is really about shining a light on, on how we think about how uh, the materials that we make interact with the environment. And I think it has important implications for, for how we recycle plastics. So as Anja introduced me, I'm from, we're currently talking from Sweden. Uh, in a few weeks, I'll be moving to Germany, um, to, to Munich. Okay, so just to give this a, a, a bit of a, a, a wider context, um, I'm going to use polyethylene, which we're all familiar with in, in some sense as a, an exemplar, an example of um, how I think that thermoplastics might um, function in a circular economy. And I'm going to ask some questions ultimately about um, how one might think about recycling them and, and, and putting them into a, a closed or circular loop. But necessarily I need to consider this material in the environment. So I'll, I'll introduce the material polyethylene, which we're no doubt familiar with as a, as, a, as a material in everyday use, but look at some of the basic physics and chemistry underpinning its interaction with the environment. 
I'll talk a little bit about the carbon cycle. I think any discussion of the circular economy actually needs to be, particularly for polymers, needs to be put into that context, to put the, it into the context of the wider environment. The specific example that I'm going to focus on is what happens to plastic in the environment. And it, we, what we did found is that there's some well-defined nanostructural changes associated with environmental exposure in the environment. And there's some take home lessons for um, utilizing what I call commodity plastics, or the pl plastics that we use for packaging in, in huge volumes um, for, the, for the environment. So I, I've stolen this slide. Um, I, I found this website, it's the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is, is, is championing um, um, the, the recycling of plastic. Um, and and we, we think about it where it comes from. Um, we, we think of um, what happens to it. So the expectation that most of it's going to be thrown away. And what I'm specifically talking about is what happens to it after we throw it away. Um, and there's some expectation that we can um, recycle it. And there's some serious limitations in the material that, that, that I'm going to talk about that we really need to think about when we produce it from the, from the raw materials and its suitability for either recycling or throwing away. And what happens to it here is really the, the, the question that I'm addressing specifically here. But to, to put this into the wider context, and uh, if, you, if, you, if you want to read about this at some depth, I'd really recommend this, this very short uh, uh, chapter in, in Primo Levi's wonderful book, The Periodic Table. Um, it's probably the most inspirational uh, piece of science writing I know for the, for the, in the last 50 years. It's 50 years, yeah. Um, but if we, if we think of uh, polyethylene and, and in general commodity plastics as some form of carbon, originally they've come from photosynthesis back in, back in, 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 in prehistoric times that the, the sunlight has been taken and, um, and the carbon dioxide through photosynthesis and turned into cellulose. And over geological timescales, the, the, the plant material has been incorporated into the soil carbon and eventually into the fossil fuel. And what we've done is put a hole down here and got the oil and the gas and use that to produce uh, different kinds of polymers. And, and really this talk is about putting these kind of materials into that context. Um, and, and, and when I originally started this work, I, I was figuring that you know, maybe the, 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 the plastics will end up back in the fossil fuel pool and, and given that humankind will be around that long, that people in the future may be looking into pieces of coal and finding, for example, a fossilized chip packet, but it really wasn't how it turned out at all. So let's, 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 let's think about this, this material polyethylene. And, and from my perspective, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a largely underappreciated material. It's a fantastic material. Very simple. Um, so there's a, there's a hydrocarbon backbone. And as I said before, that it, it comes from the fossil fuel pool. And, and that's one possible argument for not using it so much. The different polyethylenes will, of course, vary in how long this is. And this becomes an important issue when you look at um, its recyclability, how it's branching, and there's different ways we can process it. And I'll, I'll talk about a specific subclass of these materials, but it's not just a commodity plastic. Um, this is a company uh, uh, to the south of Sydney that makes these wonderful, wonderful uh, tankers for putting dangerous chemicals in. Polyethylene, because it's mechanical properties, and, and these are composite materials, these tanks, is, is extremely stable for all kinds of different chemicals. And so this is a, a really high end, high value product that you use polyethylene in. Um, this, is a, this is a fiber that's made, uh, it's used a lot for, for um, fishing lines and it's probably some of those fishing lines that for, for, uh, you people find in the ocean. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's made from quite a different process, but it's a very high end expensive, strong fiber. So just to, 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 to mention that um, polyethylene is, is quite a versatile material. And in some respects, we really underappreciate the, the, the resources that we have making it into stuff that we just throw away. 
My, my initial exposure to polyethylene uh, came through this work where we made something that was supposed to uh, degrade in a very well uh, uh, controlled way. Um, it's plastic sheeting and I'm sure there's a part of environmental hell for me um, actually uh, being involved with the development of this product because it has added a lot to polyethylene in the environment. But the idea is that in, in a colder environment, such as Sweden, for example, uh, one puts seeds underneath this polyethylene and uh, what's it, what it does is it, it warms up the environment underneath and keeps in the moisture. And this ha helps plant grow uh, quick, more quickly in a colder environment. Uh, but when the weather starts to warm up, the, 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 the uh, material has a prodegradant added and the uh, plastic um, fragments and and uh, allows the plant to grow through rather than being cooked in a, what's essentially a, a little mini greenhouse. And so this is where a lot of my understanding of the, the, the photodegradation of, of the material comes from. But what I'm going to talk mostly about today is um, barrier materials, the, the packaging that one gets with in, in the supermarket. It, it needs to be flexible, it's cheap, uh, that's why we throw it away a lot. Um, it, it, it's transparent with good barrier properties that it keeps the, the, the prod product nice and fresh and you can see how attractive it looks. Um, today, um, there's various polymers that are used for this, but I, I'm mostly going to talk about polyethylene. Um, it's interesting for me, and this is actually what I did my PhD in, is uh, uh, it, it were, were cellulosics. And in the last 20, 30 years that paper has been and it, it's actually reversing a little bit now, um, was, has been replaced as a packaging material. The, the good thing about cellulosics is that in, in terms of the carbon cycle that I was talking about before, um, they're relatively easy incorporated. There's a lot of uh, 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 mechanisms in the environment to, to, to produce, for, to, to digest the material for want of a better expression. Um, but this is where, where we've got into problems of producing lots of this cheap, flexible material with good barrier properties, but there's no real mechanisms for, 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 for environmental degradation. So this, this, is, this, is, this slide here, I've taken it from a website from a, from a, 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 a um, it's called Teen Vogue. And I, 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 this seems to be fairly representative of, of what in, in popular culture or popular science, seems to be the thoughts about people what happens to this material that it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller and it doesn't degrade and um, although the it, it's not a very uh, august scientific journal i think this is what most people think happens to the material and uh, there's this frozen uh, there's this menace of of little tiny bits of of um, polyethylene in the environment that we don't really know where they are and in some sense, this, this work really addresses where, where, where I think this material is going in our oceans. Now, that is not to say that um, th this kind of waste on the beaches isn't a hazard, it isn't an eyesore, but it's also a very um, important um, danger to, to wildlife. Um, one, one's all, it's, one just has to go to YouTube to see very distressing videos of what happens to, to, to to um, turtles and that when they when they choke on these things, um, and I, I I've taken this from the, the conversation where where you know they talk about this missing plastic and 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 what I'm going to talk about today is really addressing this issue and 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 saying that it's actually I, I think personally that it's it's not such a problem. Okay, so most of the work here I, I I'm going to acknowledge some people. Um, first and foremostly, um, I, this work was supported by the CNRS and Paris Cycle during my um, sabbatical there. But while I've been in Sweden, um, this, this paper here really has a lot of detail in it. And I, I'm going to just very touch on this with very broad strokes. But it was a, 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 long, and, and, and a long and arduous um, journey from, from, to publication. So. Um, Mariana arranged for me to come to Paris and uh, in, first of all, I think it was 2017 and 
and we, we got the, the results in a, in a couple of months and we've been arguing about the paper for, for a long time in, in only a way that the, the French know how. Um, but what we have here is a, is a, is a really nice, rigorous discussion of, of this problem of um, what happens to uh, polyethylene when it's sitting in the ocean. So the, the bits of plastic um, come from the supermarket in Paris, but also um, uh, Alexandra and her colleagues went out on a boat in the Caribbean and um, collected some from the, 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 one of these guys, the, the bottom of the North Atlantic guy. So let's, what we're talking about here is milk processed polyethylene. And we're all familiar with that if we heat up these kind of thermoplastics, they become a liquid. And if you cool them down, um, they become a solid. And at a, at, a, at a molecular level, the material is starting to crystallize, which is the, the, the thermodynamically favorable state. In fact, complete crystallization is the, the most thermodynamically favorable state. But if you think of this as a big ball of spaghetti, long flexible polymer chains, that the entanglement of the, the different polymer chains results in a situation where it cannot crystallize completely. And this is a very important concept for, for these materials, um, both in terms of their processability, in terms of what kind of mechanical properties. So for example, those fibers that I showed you at the start of my talk, these very high end fibers, they're not made from milk processing. And the, the fundamental um, insight of that process is to get them to crystallize as much as possible. But for our barrier materials, which are, and also the, the tanks, which uh, Omnitanker produce, um, the, the process is a, a melt and it starts to crystallize and it can't crystallize completely. And what one is left with is this lamella structure. This lamella structure is extremely important for the barrier properties. So for example, if one has oxygen or moisture on the outside, it's difficult for for, 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 for the oxygen or moisture to diffuse through a film made of this material. So this lamella structure is a layer of crystalline material and a layer of amorphous material and a layer of crystalline material and a layer of amorphous material. And how much crystalline material versus how much amorphous material is the crystallinity and it's related to how effectively it crystallizes. Uh, we have the perspective of a small angle X-ray scattering on this, which measures the, what I call a linear crystallinity. So the ratio of this distance to this distance. Um, I also use a Raman technique to measure the thickness of this independently. And also I look at how ordered it is in this direction. And um, the, the, what I'm looking at is, is what happens to the lamella structure, which is critical for the barrier properties of this material um, with ocean degradation. So the first thing that happens to these materials when you put them in the sun, and you've probably noticed this with, with, with even um, plastic furniture that you've got outside in the, in the harsh Australian sun, is that it starts to become brittle. Um, and it's not so apparent in Sweden, but in those uh, agricultural films that I was talking about earlier, this was the, uh, uh, the, the process by which they, they became brittle and allowed the plants to germinate. What I have here is um, a plot of the molecular weight and the, uh, the fraction, uh, the weight fraction in that. So here's, here's the, the Red commercial product that we've got from the supermarket. I think one is uh, Nesquik and another is, uh, I forget what the product inside it is, but you can see um, even in just sort of moderately weathered bo boxes that the molecular weight is, is decreasing. And as, um, as, as, we, as it sits out there longer, and these are the materials that have been gathered from the Caribbean, the, the molecular weight goes down. So if one thinks of the process is that sunlight causes a more or less random scission of uh, polymer chains in, in this material. Um, so what this does is, uh, I started off by introducing this material, um, the, the, the melt process as a kinetically frustrated. What this does is release this kinetic frustration and um, this material starts to crystallize. And this is the, the, the underpinning process of, of the environmental 
um, lifetime of, 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 of materials. Um, I'm not going to talk so much about this, but there is also an important um, chemical change, um, and that's the increase in, in oxidized or the oxidized polyethylene or the carbonyl content of that. And that, that's another story that I, I really won't be de delving into too much depth in this talk. Um, so what, what, what happens is that what we see it as the material sitting in, in the ocean, but it's equally true if we, if we have it sitting on the land in the sunlight, it's quite a different um, case if it's underground, for example, in landfill. And I'm not going to address that issue. What happens is we see an increase in the crystallinity of these materials. Interestingly, it doesn't grow in this direction. What we see is small crystals nucleate in here. Um, what we also see is this lamella structure is, is disrupted. Um, so very well-defined um, physical changes in the material. Uh, small angle scattering is probably the... the, the, the three the, minutes. The, 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 three minutes, okay. Small angle scattering, um, so we see the bump disappear. We see the material become less ordered. So this is a Nesquik package. This is moderately, and these are the kind of uh, materials that we see in the ocean. And this is what happens. So this is, this is a summary of the process that the, um, the, the chains are, are cut, that this barrier, this lamella structure is disrupted. And this is the important issue, I think, in terms of the long-term lifetime of, of this material, is that it's no longer, uh, so it's much more easy for, for oxygen to diffuse into this material. And um, the next stage of this work is to actually look at how this affects the oxidation of it. So to put this into the context of the recyclability of uh, thermoplastics in general, we, what we have of using these materials in the sunlight is a gradual loss of molecular weight through chain scission. The material becomes to lose this frustration and, and starts to crystallize much more um, easily. I think it's useful to, to put that into this context that these things that have been used uh, are, are no, have no longer the right kind of materials um, uh, right kind of material properties, that if they start to crystallize and become brittle almost straight away, um, it, it's, it's very difficult to, to introduce them into a recycling stream. And um, I think I'm almost finished there. I'll just, so I think I've posed lots of questions about um, putting, um, re recycling uh, thermoplastics. I think th there's a lot of work to be done there. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I would like to encourage our audience to put some questions into the chat. After the three talks, we will have a full discussion. So uh, I hope you can stay with us, Chris, to the end. Um, now I would like to uh, put uh, um, Jessica. Uh, Jessica is at the moment on another meeting, but she recorded a video. Uh, and I have that video to share with you. She will join us for a panel discussion a little bit um, later so i will share my screen um and stop sharing thank you okay so jessica is our um, uh, synchrotron uh, scientist she is an expert in uh, x-ray absorptions and fluores fluorescence and she will, she's also um, recently won uh, um, Falling Walls Australia. She's an amazing um, science communicator. And uh, I will start her talk right now, hopefully. When approaching these problems, we, we tend to pitch economic values and environmental values against each other. Um, but what's really exciting to me is uh, when ideas can harmonize both together. And that starts with this question. Now, what if we start thinking about all of these wastes as resources? By combining them, we can actually turn these into valuable products and offset CO2 emissions. So my work for the past few years has been about developing low cost processes to put this idea into practice. Now, how does it work? Well, firstly, we target mines that have magnesium and calcium rich rocks. 
if we irrigate their mineral waste with acids, the minerals dissolve and we get water that's rich in magnesium and calcium. When that reacts with CO2, it forms carbonate minerals. Now, carbonates are environmentally safe and they're used in industries from construction to pharmaceuticals. And storing CO2 in mineral form is actually the most safe and stable form possible. This is how the Earth stores carbon over geologic time. So it's actually the only method that is truly long term and it doesn't require the really cumbersome monitoring like with underground injection of supercritical CO2. So these, these are the processes that we're trying to develop. And there are a lot of other groups around the world working on mineral carbonation and how to do this at different scales. So for example, um, geologic injection into basalts, which um, causes these reactions to take place in situ, um, to building big reactors, like there's one in Newcastle and uh, New South Wales. Um, but there are some big questions in this system, um, particularly around trace metals. Um, and tailings in particular contain quite a lot of metals that were either not the target or uh, a result of low recovery grades. That mean that even up to 30% of the target metals can end up in the waste. And this is where the synchrotron comes in. So the first question is, what is the environmental risk of uh, accelerating mineral carbonation reaction and mineral dissolution? If these rocks contain chromium, for example, if that's oxidized, it's carcinogenic and it's really mobile. It's a mess. So we need to really uh, get a handle on this before we get too ahead of ourselves. So that's the context. Now I'm going to shift to talking a little bit about the synchrotron and what it is and some of the techniques that have applied to this work. So the synchrotron um, is a light source that produces intensely brilliant light and we often quote that it's about a million times brighter than the sun. This is what it looks on the, like on the inside uh, and I don't know if you can see my mouse but this is where the electrons start. They're uh, fired out of an electron gun and accelerated in a straight uh, linear accelerator. And then they enter this inner booster ring where they're further accelerated uh, up until almost the speed of light. They're then uh, injected into the outer storage ring, uh, which maintains a constant um, current of electrons um, at a stable and constant level for the beam lines. When charged particles are traveling at close to the speed of light, they emit light when they pass through electron magnets. So this ring is actually a whole lot of straight sections with magnets that bend the electrons around to form a circle. Now the electrons bend but the emitted light travels in a tangent and it's therefore funneled into each beam line which is these blue boxes around the outside uh, where a range of instruments are set up to use that light for analysis. Most of the beam lines use the x-ray part of the spectrum and that's because the wavelength of x-rays is about the same size scale as the dis distance between atoms so x-rays interact with matter in really interesting ways and can tell us a lot about the chemistry and the structure of materials. Now, the processes that I'm most interested in is X-ray absorption and fluorescence. Uh, so, uh, Physics 101, electrons are bound to the nucleus with energies that are characteristic to the element. It depends on the nucleus size and the number of electrons that are shielding it. So we can use this, um, and if we have the incident, I'm sorry, the incident X-ray beam um, at a higher energy than the binding energy of a core electron, um, it can absorb and that absorption increases dramatically once you um, get to that energy. When that happens, uh, an outer higher energy electron can fill that core, core hole. Uh, and as it does that, it emits an X-ray with an energy equal to the difference in those orbitals. Um, and that energy X-ray is similarly characteristic for each element. These two processes are proportional. So the information that we obtain can be obtained, can be measured in either way. In the first way, the, for absorption, um, we simply measure the intensity of the X-ray beam before and after the sample to see how much has been absorbed. Um, in the second case, to measure fluorescence, we set up a detector uh, that measures the photons um, that are emitted from the sample, and it also uh, measures what their energy is. So this involves two beam lines. So it's the XAS beam line, um, where we can do both, and the XFM beam line, which has mapping capability. This is the kind of data that we get from these techniques. On the left is the absorption spectrum. Um, this is the information that we need to get an element's oxidation state, its speciation, and its local structure. On the right is the kind of pattern our fluorescence detector receives. And each one of these peaks is a different energy. 
So a different fluorescence, so fluorescence from a different element. We can fit this and calculate which elements are there and quantify them. And because uh, fluorescence is proportional to absorption, the XFMB mine can also measure the oxidation state and the speciation of elements and map these two. This is um, an example just to illustrate um, how the absorption edge shifts depending on the oxidation state. In this case, it's for, we're looking at copper. So the more oxidized something is, the harder it is to move more, to remove more electrons. So the edge is shifted to the right to higher energy. Oh yeah, um, I think we've been through this. So um, practically at the beam line, we always measure some known um, reference materials. And in this case, uh, we've got compounds that represent manganese in the two plus, three plus and four plus oxidation states. Uh, once we've uh, established this, we can then measure unknowns uh, and simply plot them on this line to work out what their average oxidation state is. Uh, I was also gonna mention, um, yeah, there's, there's often distinctive features in the spectrum that allow us to really easily fingerprint. So chromium is, is an example where there's a really prominent pre-edge peak um, when it's in the chromium 6 plus form. Um, so this is really easy. You can tell at a glance whether there is uh, toxic chromium in a sample um, because of the presence of this feature. But you'll also notice there are two chromium 6 plus spectra here, the blue and the red, and they don't look exactly the same. So above the edge in the high part, there are some differences in oscillations there. And that's because uh, they have a different structure and different local environments, got different neighbors. So from the oscillations after the edge, the excess region, we can tell what elements are bonded to um, and how far away their neighbors are. So this is really useful um, if we want to tell, for example, if the nickel is substituted for iron in the silicate minerals or in sulfides. And we can also tell how much nickel is in each phase, for example. Uh, mapping is the specialty of the XFN beam line. Um, it's one of my favorites. These are beautiful images. Um, and what they tell you is where different elements are in a sample. So we can make, um, we can also make maps of speciation and look at where oxidized versus reduced copper is, for example. Um, but these images, they really speak for themselves. Um, we can map at very high resolution, uh, down to two microns. And we can also map samples that are millimetres in size to centimetres in size. Even uh, whole paintings or whole plants can be put into this beam line with almost no preparation. For most things, it is better to have a thin section. Um, if you want to get quantitative maps, it helps to know how thick the sample is. So that's, that's what we can do in the second So how do we apply it to this problem? We want to leach, uh, we want to acid leach mine tailings but we're worried about the potential for metalliferous drainage. The other possibility is that metals could end up in the products and the carbonate minerals. Um, at this point, we just didn't know. So I started uh, by investigating whether these metals do incorporate into carbonate minerals at all. And the answer was yes, strongly yes. All of the metals pretty much ended up in the carbonates in synthetic experiments, but it turned out that the reagents also contain some trace iron. And so there are actually a couple of phases forming in the products. So in the carbonate minerals, that, which is nesquahonite, um, we can see manganese is distributed really evenly in green uh, through the carbonate minerals. But there's also manganese in the iron oxide, um, little spots in orange there too. We looked at a whole range of different transition metals and we're also able to investigate the oxidation state for chromium too, to see if we are likely to generate uh, toxic chromium in this system. So on the right, we're looking at the absorption spectrum for chromium. So on the bottom, we kind of list our uh, reference compounds. This is what we know is chromium zero, two plus, three plus, six plus. And then we can comp compare um, what we see in the sample. So using the mapping capability, we can actually extract spectra from any pixel we like in the image. And so we extract um, the spectra from the green area where we know manganese is what well, in this case, we're talking about chromium. So where chromium was um, substituting into the, the uh, magnesium carbonate. And then we can extract another spectrum from those hotspots of iron oxyhydroxide um, to see if there's any difference in those locations. What we found is that the spectra from both of those regions is 
uh, really closely matched with the chromium 3 plus reference spectra. So that's good news. It means that chromium and the other metals that we looked at, they end up in the carbonate minerals, uh, not in the leachate where they could be uh, potentially leached into waterways, for example. Um, and we don't see chromium oxidizing into a, um, a hazardous form. That was all well for a synthetic system, but the next question is, okay, what happens in an accelerated natural system? So we then looked at mine tailings that had been carbonating for 30 years and had built up this carbonate cemented crust over the top. We mapped elemental distributions in those crusts, and in particular, we were looking across grain boundaries between the reactive grains and the, the carbonate cements forming on them. We saw again that all the transition metals we looked at were strongly retained in the carbonate cements. Finally, it was time to try that acid leaching. So we set up um, a series of 50 mil syringes, packed them with tailings, and I irrigated them with sulfuric acid every day for a month. We're simulating a heap leaching process, which is um, pretty conventionally used in mining. Pretty soon, I noticed an orange line forming just below the surface, and it migrated downwards over time. That was iron oxides precipitating out at the neutralization front. So above that line, acidic conditions are dissolving all that material. Then we see iron and transition metals crashing out, and below that, the material was pretty well unreacted and still very alkaline. Now that, uh, that front was migrating downwards over time, and um, importantly, at the other end of the syringes, um, they were free draining. We were collecting leachates um, that had really high magnesium concentrations. So they were ideal for carbonation, and they could sequester a couple of orders of magnitude more carbon than uh, in passive uh, reaction to leaching with water, for example. So even though the goal of this experiment was to see just if we could produce that uh, magnesium-rich leachates for carbon sequestration, the trace metals kind of stole the show because we found that they accumulate and enrich in this uh, discrete layer, uh, getting more concentrated over time. So nickel doubled in concentration in four weeks in that zone. And you can, t you can see from this image how strongly it's been leached out of the upper section. And that was really interesting because these specific tailings had actually been investigated as a potential nickel resource a couple of decades ago. Um, but because the nickel was primarily bound within silicate minerals, which made up the bulk of the tailings, it just wasn't economic uh, to think about as a nickel resource. But after acid leaching, we're showing here that nickel is really strongly mobilized out of the silicates in the top section. And it's being enriched with iron oxides in a discrete zone uh, which could be a lot more easily recovered and processed. I'm sorry. No. Now we're reusing all of these ways, we're neutralizing that acid, we're capturing carbon dioxide in uh, valuable carbonate minerals, but we can also transform the stockpiles of mineral waste into an enriched ore that could actually be remined. And nickel and cobalt in particular are gonna be in huge demand over the coming decades for their use in battery materials um, and other technology. Now what's also exciting about all this work is that we were not striving for 100% conversion of these wastes. Um, we weren't looking to completely carbonate this material at all. We were looking at really low energy input and low cost technologies that could be repurposed to do this uh, now, not 10 to 15 years in the future. So uh, we worked to scale up these kind of experiments from the lab, we did field trials, um, and this is now contributing to a big testing program with industry collaboration uh, at Diamond Mines in Africa and Canada. And the goal is to achieve the first carbon neutral mine in the world. Now, acid leaching is actually just one of the um, options that we investigated. Um, I also looked at direct reaction of, say, a flue gas with the tailings. Just plug a pipe in, let it infiltrate through the tailings, what happens? And it works, it's very easy. Um, this work is continuing now, um, particularly at the University of British Columbia. Uh, and this is the work of a student there recently. Um, who reacted nickel tailings with 10% CO2 flue gas um, for three weeks. 
And what they found is that there are additional benefits to doing this um, in stability. So uh, this experiment shows that the more carbonated uh, the tannins become, and here we're looking at two levels of brucite. Brucite's the reactive, the most reactive mineral, so it's a proxy for carbonation. But the more you carbonate the tailings, the more compressive strength tailings gain. And this is interesting because we've seen again and again in history how catastrophic tailings dam failures can be. So stability is really important. And if this can be enhanced by sequestering carbon dioxide, even better. Now, I just wanted to finish um, with just one more example that's more directly applied mechanics related. Um, this one isn't my work. It's from the XFM beam line a couple of years back. Um, but it's really interesting. So um, it is to do with the mining industry and the iron ore industry is one of the biggest um, the Australian economy relies on. And it really relies heavily on the railways between the Pilbara and Port Hedland. You may remember uh, this train derailment in 2018. This cost BHP 4 million tonnes of production and about 600 million US dollars. Now, although this derailment was intentional to stop an out of control train, it highlighted how critical the rail infrastructure is and the performance of the steel in rail, rail lines is, um, is paramount to avoiding a potential future accident like this. So um, this was a collaboration with the Institute of Rail Technology at Monash. Um, now because it is one of the most heavily used railways in the world, new alloys are being developed for rails and wheels to allow for higher loads and greater transport efficiency. Manganese is commonly used to increase um, the strength of steel and a little bit of it improves strength, but the higher the manganese concentration, the more brittle it is too. And it can also make welding more difficult. So in this past partnership, the synchrotron was used to investigate how the uneven distribution of elements such as manganese uh, affects the reliability of welded rails. So we're able to map um, this entire section of rail um, if we look at this load bearing section, we can visualize the manganese distribution with hotter, uh, more red colors, meaning higher concentration of manganese. Um, here we can see some linearity, but if we zoom in, sorry, uh, we can actually measure you know, the distribution of these regions and the extent of separation. And this all feeds into steel making and design to improve the lifespan and the performance of critical railways and enable better prediction of potential failures. And that's all I have time for today. Uh, so I just want to leave you with these thoughts. Now, although the synchrotron is a fancy large-scale facility, we're really good at applied science. And although I was only able to briefly touch on two techniques today, we have 10 beamlines uh, and eight more currently being built. So the scope of what we can do here is uh, really enormous. If you're interested and want to know more, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, that's how it works. We chat, we turn ideas into real plans, and then we make science happen. Thanks. Thank you. And Jessica just joined us. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't have a time for question yet. Uh, we are now moving to, um, to uh, Jun Huang, uh, Associate Professor from University Sydney, um, a recently 2020 Australian most innovative. Uh, engineer and uh, a SOAR um, a fellow uh, who will be talking about his um, research and application into waste. Thank you. I just want to find my slide. Uh, where is it? It's okay. No. Can you see it? Not yet. Oh. Let me try again. Oh. Okay, now it works. It's working? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jin Huang from uh, Chemical Engineering at the University of Sydney. My research is mainly focused on reaction engineering and also the nanocatalysis development. So, um, I lead a Sydney Nano Grand Challenge project uh, in the nanotechnology for sustainable manufacturing. So this is a cross-school uh, research program and uh, 
we mainly focus on develop a new technology, especially from science discovery to the industry application to address the majority of the sustainable challenges we faced, for example, like CO2 conversion and like uh, the waste transformation. So today I would like to uh, introduce a few of our uh, result outcomes involved in the waste transformation. For example, like to convert waste to the hydrogen and the carbon nanotube, and also like CO2 conversion to the valuable uh, products, chemicals, or the uh, fuels. We also use the biomass or wastes or the like waste papers to, as a material to produce the high value products. Um, my research is mainly focused on catalysis. And what is a catalysis? I just want to give a very brief introduction. And the catalyst itself is one kind of a material. They involve the reaction, make a reaction become faster, very fast, and make some like impossible reaction become possible, but itself never consume in like the reaction process. So this is a magic material. So for example, as a previous introduced by Chris mentioned the polyethylene. So if you mixture of the like the ethylene, they never happen, they never do a reaction, even you put it there for 100 years. But if you only put one gram of a catalyst, the reaction starts immediately, in one minute, you will generate many of the polyethylene at the room temperature. So this is the reason the catalyst is magic to drive the reaction faster. Also, this will be drive reaction faster to like degradation of the plastics and also to like reduce the CO2 or convert the CO2 to the useful uh, products. So let's take a look about the, the waste materials. The majority of the waste materials from, uh, made from the hydrogen carbons. So for example, like polyethylene, this is made from the ethylene, one kind of the, uh, hydrogen carbons from the crude oil. So if this is uh, this kind of compounds, it's a very important resource to produce the hydrogen carbon derived kind of fuels or other materials. So for example, for a hydrogen carbon, we can take the hydrogen because Australia currently, the hydrogen strategy is uh, like a significant strategy for the renewable energy. Therefore, if we are able to take out the hydrogen from the waste material, and then we are able to transfer the waste materials to the clean energy. But there is another issue, how about the carbon? So the carbon, they will transfer to the coke. This is a waste material. And normally, if we burn the coke, we will generate a large amount of CO2. So this is not our target. So in this case, we are thinking about, is it possible we design a catalyst, this magic material, to generate the hydrogen. At the same time, we convert coke, this is waste, to the carbon nanotube or carbon nanofiber. This kind of useful carbon material has a very big market in the, in the globally. Therefore, we are not able, therefore we are able to avoid the burning of the coke, and then no CO2 discharged when we transfer the waste plastic to the energy and fuels. So we developed uh, this kind of a labor and also currently the pellet plant for the, this kind of process. First, we use the liquid, the crude bio oil, as one kind of the modern reaction system. And then we pump it in, and at first to do the paralysis, and then we do the catalytic reaction then we are able to split the, this kind of hydrogen carbon material. First, we generate hydrogen coming out as a gas, and then the, the carbon, they will grow on the catalyst surface to generate the carbon fibers and the carbon nanotubes. The quality of this multi-wall carbon nanotube is very good. We come uh, compared with the commercial one, the quality is higher than then the commission one, because based on the graphene, this kind of ratio. And then we are thinking about, is it possible we to uh, transfer this like bio oil to some kind of waste? First, we try the waste, uh, biomass waste. And then we change the catalyst to twin the hydrogen production, majority of hydrogen production with a small amount of a carbon nanotube 
or we generate large amount of carbon nanotube with a small amount of hydrogen based on the catalyst different uh, chemical composition. And we realize it. And also we are able to, based on this kind of the design, for example, if the carbon nanotube price is good, if the, the market prefers the carbon nanotube, we are able to generate a large amount of carbon, carbon nanotube from the, hydrogen, from the uh, biomass waste with a very small amount of hydrogen. However, if the hydrogen price is very good, we are able to generate the majority of the hydrogen or the hydrogen based the syn gas with nearly no carbon nanotube produced. So which are able to make us to switch this kind of protease to generate the gas uh, preferred products. And then later we tried not only for the biomass, we tried all the solid wastes we have faced like the waste plastics and also the waste ties. And then we are able to tune their properties and therefore finally we optimize the process for the pellet plant. So there we are able to generate the one ton per day of carbon nanotubes from the 10 tons of a biomass or the waste plastics or ties. At the same time, we can generate a significant amount of the hydrogen. Because of high price of the carbon nanotube in the market, so the process we are generate the very obvious and understanding this kind of economic benefits compared to the previous just the, you know the combustion process. And the quality of carbon nanotube is very good. We cooperate with the carbon composite this company and the mixture of the, our carbon nanotube in the polyethylene. So we are able to increase the strength around the 15 to 19 percent of this kind of material. So as a commercial carbon nanotube can do. And another application we use this technology for the biodiesel waste like glycerol. This is uh, now is a big challenge, especially in Europe, because they uh, generate a huge amount of biodiesel, and then the glycerol become a main product, byproduct, and waste, and cannot find enough space for storage. Therefore, for this large scale, like waste, we are able to generate the huge amount of the hydrogen, improve a lot, and also very beautiful carbon nanotube. This kind of quality is very good, which are able to um, is a uh, reached the quality to make the composited material for the airplane and also other this kind of high value uh, carbon materials. So we also apply this for the tar, the coal co industry, like on the wastewater mixer with water. And then we are able to generate the carbon nanotube and on the catalyst surface and with the hydrogen. So therefore we apply this for the many, many different type of the waste resource and then to produce the customer like target, the products. And also we are able to change the steam to the like what amount, then we are able to control the hydrogen and the carbon nanotube generation. Okay, this is the first example. We are mainly focused on the, to from the hydrogen carbon waste, how we are able to take out the hydrogen and then generate the useful carbon material, then we realize the carbon free, this kind of the uh, reduction of the uh, or decomposition of the waste. So another uh, second topic I would like to introduce is the CO2 conversion. So as we know, so in the coming years, we have a strong like development of a renewable energy, but we still reliable for the liquid fuels in the coming 20, 20 years and also the natural gas. So we still have uh, you know, uh, increasing like CO2 emission to the environment. And again, we do not want to like just uh, storage the CO2 to the underground because there are no economic benefits coming from. And uh, we are thinking about the carbon dioxide will be a useful carbon resource for our society as one kind of material or raw material to generate the useful fuels and the chemicals. So like the nature plant, which can absorb the CO2 and react with water during the like uh, um, photosynthesis to generate the oxygen and also the biomass to feed, the, to feed us. So in this case, we also use the catalyst to think about how to use the CO2 conversion in the case. 
One interesting reaction is uh, reforming. So the currently, 98% of global hydrogen is generated by the steam reforming of the natural gas. So you the water reacted with the natural gas to produce the hydrogen. It's a 98% globally. But most of the natural gas rich country like Australia, Middle East, they are not rich in the water, in the fresh water. So therefore, if we are able to use a CO2 to replace the water to react with the natural gas, it will be great for these kind of countries to have this kind of hydrogen economics in the area. But the challenge for this reaction is the catalyst normally died in the 10 to 20 hours. But for the steam reforming, if you use water, which can run over 500 hours. Therefore, we are, we are thinking about Definitely, we need a very active catalyst to drive this reaction because both molecules are quite stable. So, in a few years ago, we developed a new type of the catalyst. This is the most active the single atom catalyst reported in the world. And we developed this new catalyst and we want to try for this reaction. Unfortunately, it's failed. It's a single atom is not working. But if we have four atoms together, then we are able to drive this reaction because the both molecular need the active size dissociation with them. Therefore, we generate the, if we are generating a single size catalyst, then we can find we generate the reaction conversion rate is much higher in the single atom one. But the problem is the single atom catalyst or single side catalyst is not stable. The size is around one to two nanometer. But when we do the in situ TN, we find, you can see the video, this is in the nanoscale, we can find if we have a porous structure of the holster, this kind of like particles, they're always moving inside, cannot grow bigger and lost the active size, and also which can wash the inside, there's no coke generation. That's mean which can overcome the challenge of the sintering and the coke generation. And we also do the modeling, we confirm this kind of idea because the surface atoms are running at the high temperature, drive this moving inside the pores and clean the system and also make there no sintering. Then we just simply tried to make the nanoparticle inside the pore and a mixture, the sun outside, the sun inside the pore and or totally outside the pore. And then we find if we're totally inside the pore, you can find that it's keep a higher conversion, never lost activity. But if this is a mixture or the totally outside the pore, the activity lost as most of the current published result and even in the industry catalyst. So in later, we introduced the calcium oxide, uh, like calcium oxide inside. Then we combined the carbon capture and also reaction together. We are able to move, put this device in the exhaust gas system and then we capture and convert it to the like important fuels. John, three most, minutes. Okay, so most important, the activity, if it's stability is great. We are able to reach more than 12, uh, 1200 hours. It's much, much better. So they only reported like a uh, uh, result. And uh, we also realized directly that natural gas and the CO2 convert to the acidic acids. This is also a very big uh, chemicals used in the market. It's around over 5 million tons per year, like requirement due to the time limitation. I just want to uh, go to the final uh, topic about the waste paper transformation. So we are able to um, use a two-stage reaction system with a catalyst to transfer the waste paper or cardboard or biomass to the fuels. And also we can make the plastics and also other containers from the waste you know, papers and also the cardboard because of currently the online shopping become more and more popular and there are more and more waste papers and around us. So we are able to use the biocatalyst to transfer the waste paper or cardboard to the ethanol, bioethanol. And currently bioethanol production is over like six, 600 million ton per year. 
And then we from the bioethanol to generate the bioethylene. This we can use for the polyethylene. And you can find that the main challenge for this kind of process is they have a longer induction period for uh, conversion. And uh, recently we developed a new catalyst, which shot it previously 10 hours, then we shot it to only like a half hour to an hour. And then we are able to like make it easily for commercialization. Okay, that's all for my uh, talk. And uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I'd like to um, answer your all questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate this three fantastic talk. I apologize for inconvenience during Jessica's presentation. Jessica, are you there? Can we see you, Chris? Um, I can see that some people join us a little bit later. So I'm just going to remind everybody that we have today Professor Chris Garby, uh, who works in Biofilms uh, Research Center uh, for Biointerface and Biomedical Science uh, in Malmo University. And he talked about phase of microplastic and waste. Jessica Hamilton from in Instrument Scientist from Australian Synchrotron on reducing, reusing, and recycling mining waste. And Professor Jun Huang. Uh, so, so our fellow from School of Chemistry and Biomolecular, Biomolecular Engineering in the, um, at the University of uh, Sydney, just finished it off on time, thank you, um, on optimizing a sustainability for the catalytic conversations. Um, you are welcome to uh, start QA and questions. We have some questions um, being sent to us uh, during the, your registration. Thank you very much for that. And maybe when you become uh, um, a little bit more um, engaged, uh, we have more questions, but I start with those. Uh, and I start with Chris. Chris, uh, I would like to uh, ask you if you can um, tell us a little bit more um, about how uh, X-ray versus um, neutrons uh, towards um, dealing with uh, a degradation of plastic. X-rays versus, new I think it's about the scientific question that you're asking. Um, we, we, X-rays are, are really good for, for, for looking at local structure. I, I think that techniques like imaging, um, neutron imaging are, are probably quite powerful for looking at the interaction um, of, um, with, with the environment. We, we, we've done some quite nice work at looking at composting with, um, with imaging and we're hoping to publish that. Um, I, I think it's, you, you need to, 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 to think about the scientific question that, that you're asking and then look at the most um, suitable technique. Thank you very much. Um, Jessica, um, I would like to uh, give you opportunity to introduce yourself <laughs> first. Sure, thanks, Anya. I'm sorry I couldn't make it um, to do this talk live, uh, but it sounds like the recording went 99% great, <laughs> but so thank you. <laughs> no, it was, that was good. Um, I'm working on the X-ray absorption spectroscopy beam line at the Australian Synchrotron. Um, my background's in geoscience, and so I've done a lot of work in mine tailings and looking at uh, carbon sequestration, obviously, and how uh, what trace metals are doing in uh, mine tailings, soils, and the environment. Um, I'm really I love using the synchrotron techniques um, and being able to couple that with uh, lab experiments and field experiments too. So uh, making sure, you know, we connect that really fundamental science with really practical applications. I'm really um, quite passionate about making those links and doing things that are um, really applicable to industry and solving real world problems uh, in the environment. I wanted to follow up on that question. I would like to ask you how much CO2 can uh, you offset with this process, the, the process that you were particularly proposing? If we look at um, if we look at all the mine tailings that are really suitable for this, so the, the mine tailings that are rich in magnesium and calcium are the targets. We produce globally about four hundred million tons per year of that kind of tailings. If we were to carbonate all of it, one hundred percent, that would offset uh, one hundred and seventy five megatons of CO two per year. That's, that's a drop in a bucket compared to global um, CO2 emissions, uh, which is on the order of 40 mega, uh, so gigatons per year. So it's not, um, this is kind of, it's not a, um, a silver bullet for climate change. What it is though, is a site-based solution. 
So on the scale of an individual mine site, it can make a huge difference. Uh, so a lot of the work um, up until recently has been looking at passive uh, weathering and how much carbon is uh, being sequestered in tailings just due to reaction with the atmosphere and surface waters. And if we take um, Mount Keith nickel mine um, as an example, it's one of the biggest nickel mines in the world, it's in WA. Um, passive reaction of their tailings is offsetting about 11% of their annual emissions every year. So that's, um, that's awesome because that's a starting point. That's um, a baseline. And if we can accelerate those reactions further, it tells us that we only need to accelerate rates by 10 times to make one of the biggest nickel mines in the world carbon neutral. And so that's kind of where the power of this technology is. And accelerating rates by 10 times is achievable. Um, we've done it. We've shown that in the lab. And so now it's the process of scaling up and demonstrating that in the field as well. Um, that's the tricky part because every mine is a little bit different. Um, every mine has different geochemistry and mineralogy and that uh, means you need to optimize um, and maybe pick a solution for each individual mine site. Um, but carbon neutral mines individually is kind of what this is about and I think the idea of that is actually really powerful on a global scale. If you start getting carbon neutral mines and the mining industry leading in that space, um, that's powerful and that's exciting and I think that will have a bigger reach um, than the the carbon offset itself. Thank you very much. Uh, so June, now, now your turn. Is the catalytic technology feasible? Yes, actually the catalytic, uh, catalytic technology is already dominant in the chemical industry. So the current, uh, I think, the account is uh, it contribute around 30% of the GDP. So all the gasoline and all the like uh, diesels we feel right now is from a catalytic technology. So coming from the petrochemical process, even for the environment applications. So like uh, the, every car, they have the purification system. They also use the catalytic technology. So, so we have uh, already available like a techn a technology support for the catalyst manufacturing and reactor process this kind of design and the manufacturing for, the, for that. Oh, thank you very much. Um, okay, let's go back to Chris. Um, so Chris, uh, can you, uh, you talk about um, in your presentation that you don't think that uh, uh, plastic is really a problem um, uh, from your perspective. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? That wasn't really quite what I was saying. I was saying that we need to think about, I mean, that, 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 that's really the problem with, with this kind of um, science if you like that the the moment that you bring up this that there there isn't some problem that, that the problem's actually less bad than first thought um I, I think then you you start to have an argument about whether it's at all a problem and and this is one of the great failures of the environmental movement is that they're quite willing to engage in a polemic about about exactly what they want you to do but any qualifications are not are not taken account of. And so all I was saying was that in the ocean, there's a lot of fear about all, per all pervasive nanoplastics, and we've had a lot of trouble finding them. I think they're probably not there, that they've been degraded. And, and this is my research moment. But this is not to say that there's not a huge waste problem with, with, nano with plastics. They're two different issues. And if we convolve the two issues, I think we're losing sight of the solution to the problem. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, and let me ask uh, Jessica. Um, how do you uh, enhance, there's a question from Rod, uh, how do you enhance uh, carbon segregation, soil formation and trace metal recovery from mine tailing? without damaging any environment on coasting land shifts? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, actually, a lot of my research has been kind of focused on what potential environmental impacts could be um, as a result of accelerating these reactions. That's kind of, that was my entry point into this um, science. So the first, um, the question that we addressed was what would happen if, um, you know, we're generating these leachates. Could we, I mean, sorry, if we're acid leaching mine tailings in a real life situation, you're getting leachates and if they contain um, potentially toxic trace metals, 
that could you know generate a whole new environmental problem so uh, that's one thing we looked at um, both in synthetic systems so you know do the products of this reaction do they actually take up um, the trace metals or you know are they found in um, the liquid phase instead and um, and we found that they were really strongly incorporated into carbonate minerals and iron oxy hydroxide minerals and we in both synthetic and natural systems um, we haven't found um, really detectable loads of trace metals um, in leachate fluids um, so that's that's a good sign um, and then the second aspect um, I guess of of safety is stabilization um, so I touched on that a little bit and yes um, you know when you do react to these tailings with carbon um, you form new minerals so you're getting um, new phases shifting around and you're getting um, movement potentially it's also an exothermic reaction as well it generates heat uh, so those things definitely need a lot more research um, into them in uh, natural systems we get a, a carbonate cement kind of forming on the surface and it actually does stabilize the tailings um, and experiments uh, looking at bubbling um, CO2 through uh, tailings have also shown that it, it actually increases um, compressive strength. Um, so if you're imagining, um, if you're reacting CO2 with a liquid stream of tailings as it grows out, um, if it's a fine grain mass, it's kind of carbonating, it actually solidifies as more of a cement um, than you know, a loose slurry than it would. So it does improve uh, the properties in terms of stability as well. So there's, there's always questions. And I think we, you know, whenever we scale up technology, we have to vet and check, you know, all the potential side effects of what we're doing. Um, that's absolutely essential. It turns out that there are actually a lot of benefits in that regard, environmental pluses that come along with this technology. So that's really cool. Mm, thank you. June, we have a question from Alan. If you reform gas and CO2 to CO is in the chat uh, and H2, H2 is useful, what, uh, what is to use for, uh, what is the use for of uh, CO? Thank you. Actually, this is a nice question. I have a ton of medicine for the presentation. I didn't got a chance to explain, but now is a great time for me. So first, there are actually two things. The first, the carbon monoxide is a very important like industry chemicals. Its price is a double of the natural gas. So it's, it's expensive the natural gas. They use it for the chemical synthesis of some functional group, especially for ketones and RS. So a second one, this, uh, this is the first utilization. A second utilization is very important for the hydrogen storage. So as we learned, so the one challenge for the hydrogen economy is how to store and also transport the hydrogen. And there are one very um, currently, I think about a popular way, especially in the Japan and the United States, is to transfer the hydrogen to the methanol. And globally, most of the methanol are coming from uh, synthesis from the carbon monoxide and the hydrogen. So it's over the 100 million tons of the methanol every year produced by the hydrogen and also the, the carbon monoxide. So this is uh, another opportunity. This is already commercialized. So this is, can be used as uh, like hydrogen storage, like uh, the synthesis. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, you. Chris, the same, uh, there's a question for you uh, from Alan. Um, aren't the degraded plastics suited for uh, melt processing again? Uh, the, the, the short answer is no, um, but there's a longer answer. Um, I, I don't know whether Many people out there buy plastic pots from Bunnings. There's the, you can buy these black plastic pots, they're the cheapest ones. And if you sit them out in the sun, they, they become brittle and, and over, over a period of several years. And in some sense, they're a great commercial product. They have a built-in obsolescence in there. If, if, if you go and buy, um, and I know this is true, if you buy uh, second-hand pots that have a certain vintage, um, they last for years. And, and the reason for this is that they have a lot of stabilizers in there that um, they're, they're quite resistant to, to processing. Any kind of processing will do, do cause breakages, will cause change decisions and ultimately limit the, 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 the use of it. And, and, and one might take the view that 
there's, there's certain grades of waste plastic that, for example, one might want to catalytically convert into something useful. But, uh, for example, if you were to take uh, uh, some of these very high value polyethylenes or polyethylene with a stabilizer in it, and the same thing is applicable to, 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 to other thermoplastics, one can recycle them. So the short answer is eventually they will lose their usability for, 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 for making materials. But uh, I don't think that should be the, 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 the end of them. I think, you know, all these processes uh, should be looked, I, the way I think about it, we should look to ecosystems for, 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 for um, some kind of inspiration that by integrating different technologies, we, we have a much more resilient structure. And I, I think that's the, the, the way to go. There's no, yeah, certainly if, if, if I get my um, uh, polyethylene chair that's been sitting out in the sun and it's brittle, it's not much use for making into anything. But if I have a high value product and think of how I'm going to use it in the future, that's really the kind of answer. And, and what we do with the waste, there's different, um, different ways we could use it. Thank you very much. Uh, Jess, um, I have a question from the chat, uh, uh, from, the, from the QA. Um, if the industry, recycle industry wanted to uh, use synchrotron, uh, how do how they can do that? What the what the requirements for the industry to use Australian synchrotron? Um, yeah, there, that's a good question. There is actually um, there's there's two different pathways to access the synchrotron, um, and there is one that's kind of ideally um, set up for industry. So a lot of scientists at universities will apply uh, in what we call the merit round. Um, and submit a proposal that's reviewed by a panel of experts, um, external people. Um, and then the best proposals are ranked and get awarded being time. But that's not, um, that's not always the best way or it's, it might not be suitable for a lot of project ideas, especially when industry is involved and you don't want um, a panel of random people you don't know to be reading your proposal. Um, there's confidentiality. You might also want the data quick. You might want, um, you don't want to, you know, enter the, the lottery uh, for beam time. If you if you really want that time, um, there's a paid access route. So um, that's kind of set up for industry. It gives um, us a way to um, run experiments, have um, non-disclosure agreements if that's required, uh, extra security around data so it's more private, um, and to be able to access beam time when you want it as well. So um, we do. You have to kind of balance um, work at the synchrotron between um, industry clients and um, university science clients, and there's allocated um, pools of time for each. Okay, uh, June, we have a question from Tom Thomas. Uh, what is the best economic analysis of catalytic conversion of waste to valuable product? That's that was great. before your presentation was uh, <laughs> was already presented, but I think you can elaborate a little bit more. Okay, great. Thank you. Actually, this is a uh, yeah, this is actually uh, this is a good adventure for catalyst, uh, catalyst to drive the high value products. I think for the uh, economic assessment, the most important is how additive this kind of value can come in from this kind of products from the waste. So, for example, as I introduced in the in the slide, so for the carbon nanotube from the waste plastic or waste ties. Their value is uh, the, the price is around 100 US dollar per kilogram. So this is a, this is a very good product. So so normally we we evaluate the process. So even the price of the carbon nanotube one dollar per kilogram, we are able to balance the cost and the, you know the, the running cost. So now this is already 100 dollars per kilogram. This is this is a huge huge beneficial. But this is just one side. Another side is uh, one limitation of the carbon nanotube for the wider application in the current manufacturing because the one key issue is the price too high. So 100 kilogram, uh, $100 per kilogram for a carbon nanotube, this is too high for manufacturing. But if they calculate, if the price drop to the $20 per kilogram and the carbon nanotube like go to the industry, the, the capacity will be increased a hundred times more. If it's decreased to 10 like dollars per kilogram, then it'll be nearly 
caught, uh, we are consumed around like 100 million ton per year. So this is have a huge business. But even for the $10 per kilogram, this is also, they have a very beneficial for our process because our cost is just $1. So I think this is a good advantage because the catalytic process, which are able, uh, which are able to selective to generate the target products, which are, which from waste and make, which can make the extremely the lower price for the, for the market, but high, uh, high beneficial for the waste utilization. Thank you, Jun. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, have a, like a generic uh, question. Uh, you know, it, we have only four minutes to go. Uh, I wanted to ask you, do you, you know, during the pandemic, uh, yesterday we have a lot uh, fantastic discussion uh, here in the conference about the medical waste. And uh, I just wanted to ask you, how do you think uh, medical plastic in particular can be um, utilized using your research uh, platform? Chris, you want to go first? Uh, I think the, the obvious problem with, with medical waste is the... the, the, the if it's not email. hazardous. <laughs> Well, the process by not making it, making it hazardous. So for me, if, if, if you, for example, expose it to gamma radiation or even cook it, there, there's going to be some um, chain scission there. And, and, and really to, to think about, well, well what, what, what have I got at the end of this processing? And, and what, no, how, how can I melt process it? That, that would be my immediate thing. So I'm, I'm immediately thinking about, well, you know, what's the starting material and characterizing that. Um, yeah. Thank you. What about you, uh, Jess? Oh, geez, this is a tough one. I can't say I've thought too much about this before. <laughs> we don't have that problem in minds yet. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've been kind of disappointed by how much, you know, just rubbish I see as a citizen. Um, there's been, you know, so many masks lying around and so much, you know, a, a return to the disposable um, in the last few months where, you know, I thought we were making real great progress on um, making more sustainable decisions in terms of our coffee cups and just little things. But since the pandemic, everyone is kind of using this PPE. It's not just in the health industry. It's not just in the universities where people know how to dispose of these things. And there's, um, you know, set up waste streams to handle these things. Um, now, you know, everyone is doing it and it's going into landfill or the streets. And uh, I guess education is a massive part of it. Um, but also it has to be in the infrastructure, I guess. You know, there's, I feel like I'll, you know, from an outsider's perspective, I'm not an expert on this, but the recycling industry in Australia doesn't seem to have, um, you know, Maybe because we don't have much, such a you know, huge effect of pandemic. Uh, yeah, you know, but I think we could do fine. better in terms of how we process waste in general um, compared to the rest of the world. Um, and so I think, yeah, my perspective is, is not as an expert in this, but just um, from what we see, I think stopping it at the source and developing better ways to, um, to deal with it, whether it goes to landfill or recycling, um, that needs investment and support and attention. Thank you. And June, the final words, maybe you have the solution. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Actually, for like our catalytic process, we have no like um, uh, se like a quite like uh, no quite selective for the resource. So as I introduced, whatever this is uh, like solid uh, uh, waste, plastic, tie, and the biomass, or this is uh, like the the glycerol or the the tars and others. If this is hydrogen carbon, therefore we are able to transfer it. To our, uh, to our products use uh, this conversion technology. So therefore for us, the, the medical waste, also plastics, this is for us is the same chemical composition. Even for virus itself also, the hydrogen carbons. Virus mm -hmm. itself, the contain hydrogen carbons, the mixture of the, they have water, we also require water in the process. So mixing them together, no virus for our process, we are able to transfer them to the other product. <laughs> oh, it only just have to be economic so the industry can adopt it, isn't it? Yes, and uh, actually for the uh, virus, because the trees, the amount is too low, they have no big impact for the, you know, especially for our carbon nanotube production. This is just mix them together, then we just go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, uh, we uh, just uh, reached our time frame for this session. Uh, on behalf of all the um, uh, all the people who organize it, uh, very great uh, support from the organizers. We we have to get this session. I apologize for any mistakes I make. <laughs> I didn't mean. Um, it was a fantastic talks and uh, really uh, for me uh, quite a lot of eye opening. What we can do with neutrons and synchrotron and uh, chemical in the engineering and catalyst to improve our deal uh, with. Um, with waste and uh, and uh, have a better circular economy i think um in australia and around the world uh, i hope um, and thank you very much uh, to you all and if you have any more questions you were shy and you wanted to ask uh, a little bit later please uh, put it into the chat and we i will make sure that it reached the appropriate person thank you very much and have a wonderful uh, evening uh, and uh, I hope you Chris you have a lovely day thank you